Take the class structure of the United States or on the whole of the North Atlantic society. The simplest form of the class structure you could say the following. There is a professional business class. Then there is a small business class. Then there is a working class which has a white collar and a blue collar component. And then there is a racially stigmatized underclass in the unstable part of the labor market. That's basically the class structure of the United States and of on the whole, the advanced societies. So we can have a restrictive definition of the petty bourgeois or an ample definition. The restrictive definition is it's just the small business class. The ample definition is that it includes as well at least the white collar segment of the working class. And in general, all those who occupy the subordinate, disempowered positions in the economy, but who aspire to modest prosperity and independence. Uh, that's the majority of humanity. If you ex extend the definition to include aspiration as well as objective circumstance. Yes. Louder, please. The predicament that I've just described with these four dimensions, its history is the history of modern societies. It's the, the, in the form that I've described it, I think it's become clear to us in the, as of the late 20th century. Uh, but it was developing for a long time. So. I'm trying to see it without any, any softening. I'm, as it is, it's a very harsh circumstance. To confront it is the first step to its transformation. Uh, and I, in saying this, I, I speak as one who believes not only in the desirability of transformation, but in the possibility of transformation. So although I have just represented this predicament in very harsh form, in fact, I believe that it is rich with transformative opportunity. And that's the spirit in which I want to engage this situation. But the beginning of our power to seize the transformative opportunity lies in the, in the recognition of the reality. Without any illusion, without any effacement of all of these obstacles. Yes. No, no, I'll tell you why. Because, because there's, I, I want in the first part of the course now then to develop the, the conception of the goals and of the method, but I'm proceeding by successive approximations. So uh, I don't want at this early step to uh, develop any particular philosophical argument. Let, let me describe a form of this, because it isn't some sectarian philosophical position that I am referring to. It is a conventional view. It is a major view in the history of our civilization. So let me describe a variant of it, which, of this idea, which should be entirely familiar. The classical liberal thinkers like John Stuart Mill and Tocqueville 
uh, had the fear that the, the democracies that were arising in the 19th century would be societies of sheep, of conformists. So there would be greater equality, there would be greater freedom, but there would not be strong characters. The aristocratic experience of self-possession, of being your own master, of taking the world by storm, would be cast aside. And uh, these societies of more, more equal and freer people would also be societies of servile people. That was their fear. Uh, and their view was that no aim of political life was more important than to resist this tendency and to do whatever necessary to ensure that the aristocratic experience of self-possession, rather than being simply suppressed, would be universalized, and it would have to be reinvented. That's a variant of this idea. But of course, there are many other variants. So, for example, there is the view in the Romantic movement and then in the worldwide popular romantic culture that is now one of the great revolutionary forces in the world, that everyone can have a complicated big life with a deep subjectivity. A poor person in the interior of India or of Brazil can see a soap opera on the television designed according to the, the formula of a 19th century romantic narrative and receive the message that he can be like that also. He can have a deep subjectivity, a series of adventures, of self-transformation, of self-construction. That's the message that has set the world on fire. And, uh, it's another version of this idea that I attributed before to Tocqueville and to Mill. So the content of this notion of a larger life, of bigger capability, is ill-defined, but no less powerful for that. And our Part of our task is to give it content, to, to ask what's, what's in it. But it's not just a theoretical conceit. It's a real force in the world. So the next step is to explore this circumstance that I've just begun to represent. First in the context of the United States and then in the context of Europe. And I'm going to say some very general things because later on in the course, in much greater detail, we are going to address the American context and the European context. And my remarks now will have a, a very polemical slant, but their, their, their purpose is to suggest a view of how this universal predicament manifests itself in a series of national variations in the world today. So first, the United States. Now, there's a paradoxical feature of American society, of the American democracy, with which you are all familiar. The United States is by far the most unequal of the rich industrial democracies.
And it most definitely has a class structure. But at the same time, the American self-conception, the self-conception of the American democracy is of classlessness, of the illegitimacy of class divisions, even to the point of rendering them relatively invisible. Let me read you a statement from a, uh, a speech of Herbert Hoover's in the course of his unsuccessful campaign to be reelected as President of the United States. It is a, a characteristic statement of this feature of the dominant American ideology. Hoover says, speaking in Madison Square Garden, it is by the maintenance of a quality of opportunity and therefore of a society absolutely fluid in freedom of the movement of its human particles that our individualism departs from the individualism of Europe. We resent class distinction because there can be no rise for the individual through the frozen strata of classes. And no stratification of class can take place in a mass livened by the free rise of its particles. Uh, in the late 20th century, and most uh, rapidly from about the time of the presidency of Lyndon Johnson, the United States began to suffer a series of downward inflections, which have persisted ever since. First, greater inequality in all dimensions of inequality, of which the most striking and the least remarked is inequality in wages, the most extreme form of growth of inequality is inequality in the wage structure, wage dispersion. in part because the financial elite in the United States now receives much of its compensation in the form of quasi-wage benefits. Inequality in the United States is the greatest it has been at least since the 1920s. The second inflection is a diminishment of engagement in cooperative or collective social activities in the construction of so-called social capital. And the third is a diminishment of political engagement, of engagement in public life. These tendencies uh, have been manifest in all the rich North Atlantic societies to one extent or another, but in the United States they took uh, extreme form. The political basis or the political counterpart of these inflections, which objectively signal the failure of the progressives in the United States is the lack of a sequel to Roosevelt's project. The progressives in the United States, within and outside the Democratic Party, failed to establish a sequel to the New Deal program in the course of the late